Uh, thank you guys for coming. Are we good? Yeah, we're good to start. Awesome. Uh, so, by way of introduction, um, I am a program manager at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and an associate fellow at the R Street Institute. I'm also a PhD student in economics at George Mason. I graduated with my master's a couple years ago, so I'm just kind of getting all the degrees. Um, I work mainly in emerging technologies with a specific interest in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality policy and cybersecurity and Internet of Things. So I also believe uh, being an academic is to be constantly learning. So I would love and appreciate um, if at the end you have any suggestions or can notice any uh, literature I've missed or have any feedback on the presentation itself. So I look at this as a collective action problem. This is sort of an economist lens of way of looking at this problem. So what is a collective action problem? It is one in which it would take a lot of effort from multiple individuals to solve a problem, but the costs are too high for, say, one individual or one organization to solve it alone. So classic examples of that are things like um, national defense or um, rebounding after a natural disaster. So given that cyber insecurity occurs in this complex ecosystem and it's costly to address for any one actor, this is, this is exactly the problem we're dealing with. In this presentation, I aim to give you a clear understanding of the cybersecurity ecosystem and some of the endemic problems presented by the growth of the Internet of Things. I will also review the public policy landscape and offer a general framework for achieving resilience against cyber attacks. And this framework will be grounded in polycentric governance. So the Internet of Things is really an array of connected devices that send and receive data. So that includes everything, smartphones, computers, um, virtual reality headsets, autonomous vehicles, and IoT numbers are large, or IoT devices are large in number, but also in scope, so the types of things that we use them for. There are currently more devices than there are people in the world. There are around 30 billion connected devices. In 2020, we're expected to have almost three devices per person. Laptop and desktop computers now account for less than 25% of internet network traffic. So American households are now using, on average, seven devices every day. And as the Internet of Things uh, expands, we put microprocessors in more and more devices, and that increases the number of potential threat vectors for data breaches and cyber attacks. Now, the cybersecurity challenge to the Internet of Things is unique because the insecurity of one device affects the security of some of these devices across the planet. So this is sort of the traditional externalities framework. Something that I do here can affect your ability to access the, uh, the network in an entirely different state or country. Now, this is very different because um, normally, like, the owner of an insecure, insecure home, for example, will bear the full cost of robbery of that home, um, but that's not true for the owner of an insecure uh, IoT device. Cyber attacks are also increasing in scale and frequency, so 70% of the most common IoT devices contain at least one security vulnerability. What's, what does that mean? So vulnerabilities include lack of password security, um, insecure interfaces, at inadequate encryption, and broad user access permissions, among many other things. Uh, I absolutely love the trend of naming cyber vulnerabilities. Um, I will also say it probably isn't helpful in the larger context. Uh, it sort of started with Heartbleed in 2014. You can see Heartbleed even had its own like logo for a time. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of these because I think they're sort of emblematic of where we see the cyber landscape going today. Uh, the first is the Mirai botnet. So that was half a million devices that brought down high profile websites like Twitter and New York Times for several hours at a time. Um, in spring of 2017, there was a Cloud Pets breach. This is particularly important because it, it was an attack on, on children's information. Basically, they had, it was stuffed animal toys that you could like send messages through, and the database, they just had like no password on it. So people got child's names and different um, birthdays and things like that. And in 2017 summer, there was the Petya ransomware attack. Um, that paralyzed airports and government departments. It was kind of a wake-up call for, for a lot of Europe. Um, companies and individuals who hadn't updated their Windows software had to pay Bitcoin to criminals uh, in order to regain access to the files that are on their computer. And then last Halloween, you may have heard uh, of the Reaper botnet, um, and that infected one million networks uh, via their routers. 
Now, most recently, last week, Facebook announced that uh, 50 million user accounts had a vulnerability that could have been leveraged. So far, they haven't released evidence on whether it, it had been leveraged in a, in a bad way. Um, but these are some of the dangers. I think it's important at this point to not forget sort of the benefits attached to the Internet of Things. There's the convenience of having more instant control. Um, my favorite example is like being able to turn the lights off um, from your bed. I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, web cameras, Nest thermostats, uh, you name it. The other thing element is that they're productivity enhancing to a certain degree. So asking Alexa how many uh, teaspoons in a tablespoon or setting a timer for 10 minutes in the future, these are all very happy functionalities. Um, technologies like botnets, while, the, while they've gotten a really bad rep, um, can actually be used for good. I think that's a very important thing to, to point out. Um, bots can, can often be used to leverage computing power to do things like medical research. So the Stanford Protein Folding Project is a great example. And they can also be used to search for extraterrestrial life. So he has a project, you can set your computer up to do that. Uh, but despite these benefits, the way these things are talked about is very much these pictures. Um, botnets are personified as like a zombie army of devices, and you have sort of the faceless hooded guy um, doing some pretty inaccurate representings of coding. Um, and that's, that's pretty understandable now why there's this sort of fear associated with it. I laugh because I'm, I'm a quasi-regular contributor to The Hill, and every time they pick a picture to go in my story, they pick like the same picture over and over again, and it's like basically that guy, um, which I think is pretty, pretty entertaining, but also probably not helpful. Um, so I really like this graph. Uh, it's a couple years old, but it was produced by ITIF, which is a think tank in DC. Uh, the point I want to make here is that fear should not be driving uh, public response, and yet it often does. It often also drives uh, policy response. So gotta love Black Mirror, gotta love Westworld, um, but they really take one piece of technology to the extreme in a way that I, I'm not sure is, is, uh, is helpful in the, in the way that we think about these technologies, because I think it, instead it's helpful to remind ourselves that technologies go through a process of, of normalization. Um, so policies made at the height of hysteria usually end up being overcorrections. I'll give you an example there. Um, one of my favorites is there was a park in Milwaukee, and uh, during the Pokemon Go like height of the craze, people were just all over that park, and they, they looted it or littered or whatever they did, and the Milwaukee County government was extraordinarily angry, so they sued um, well, actually what ended up happening is they put out a requirement for companies to get permits and also to get like $1 million of insurance, which was, and it, these companies are like Niantic, so like they, Niantic would have to know that a user was in the park and then they would have to file a permit based on how many users were in the park every single day. Um, and that was pretty unreasonable. So Candy Lab, which was the owner of Texas Ropem, which was another AR location-based game with cards, uh, they ended up suing the Milwaukee uh, County um, government and basically it went to court and the, the, the judge was like laughing because he was like this is the most absurd piece of requirement I've ever seen in terms of making companies do this. Um, it ended up being that um, their, the insurance for the county government ended up paying out the legal fees for candy labs and suing them. It was actually a first amendment defense which is more interesting than anything of all. They were like you, you know we've created this piece of art um, people want to use it and they can't because of this permit uh, scheme. Um, so that was actually a, a super fascinating example of precisely why um, those sort of overcorrective policies right at the point of that um, height of that hysteria was, was pretty, pretty uh, detrimental. So in this visual, I'd say the Internet of Things is actually approaching the height of hysteria now and VR and AR is behind by a couple of years. Another great example is people like to point out cameras. There's some great Time magazine covers from back in the day where people were freaking out about like the public use of, of cameras and someone was just going to take a picture of you and put it somewhere and it would just be the scariest thing in the world. Um, and over time, it's become very normal and norms have developed around using your camera phone. So if I were to like, put this in your face, that would probably be something that was frowned upon and I know that. Um, but over time, those things get normalized. So when one associates an emerging technology with a scary scenario, it's easy to imagine how fear can drive policy responses, uh, but there are costs to responding with, uh, with restrictive regulation. Um, it has effects on innovation, experimentation, and it can raise barriers to competition going forward. So already the cybersecurity policy landscape worldwide is tending towards this type of precautionary response. Now, the landscape itself is in many ways as complex as the problem is trying to solve. 
Um, computer security expert Bruce Schneier, MIT, he argues that device man manufacturers simply lack the incentive to contribute to the commons of good security and that consumers will not demand it. So his whole argument is for some, some type of command and control federal agency that should be given the power to, to manage this situation. Things like inspecting devices, mandating security features, and uh, punishing manufacturers. That's some sort of like a digital safety agency. Um, on top of that, the Center for Democracy and Technology has declared that market forces driving the adoption of more and more connectivity features have not been sufficient to encourage privacy and security requirements. Um, this language is sort of that cybersecurity is a market failure, and that justifies some sort of a regulatory response. Um, but there's a couple of assumptions in there that I would like to challenge. I think this analysis is, is slightly short-sighted. So the development of the IoT market itself is an ongoing process. Because it appears to have failed in one instance, um, at one point in time sort of ignores the fact that the ecosystem is, is constantly changing and solutions can emerge from that. Threats emerge, so do solutions over time. The development, um, the critique also really ignores the role of entrepreneurs in an economy. So entrepreneurs, they find opportunities to create value, so when a market failure in theory occurs, uh, they view it as a market opportunity to come in and provide a, a service. Um, that could be critical information about devices or cybersecurity guidance uh, to consumers. But nevertheless, there's a lot of pressure right now for someone to do something about insecurity. Um, some of the trade-offs that exist with, with sort of the regulatory approach, I wanna, I wanna name a few um, and give specific examples of some of the legislation that, that's coming out. So um, there are a few bills in Congress right now uh, that aim to require certain device security standards for classes of devices, something similar to like an Energy Star for um, IoT devices. And in theory, uh, there's a lot of good for, for sort of like basic cybersecurity standards, like shipping things that don't have uh, default passwords, um, or uh, I think basically that um, something like that is very different from what exists in the bills right now. So because devices have unique functions and protocols and uses, one size fit all regulation um, can be based on uh, design standards that are actually gonna solidify uh, requirements over time. Um, it can be outdated and introduce a lot of compliant costs that deter IoT innovation. It can also sort of limit flexibility of companies to respond to an issue as they arrive. So this is something I want to harp on a lot, because I think that organizational learning is really, really important in this context. And if that's sort of offset by checking boxes, regulatory compliance style, um, that can be pretty dangerous. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Pokemon Go's chief legal officer, I was on a panel with him, and he gave a super interesting example of how when it just came out, they hadn't realized that there were areas in Ukraine that um, had actual like landmines in them. Um, and so they had to like figure out how to like geo block those sort of locations so people wouldn't chase Pokemons into land, land, uh, landmine fields. Um, so that was an example of something where it's like not anticipated, probably not anticipatable by, um, by, by every single person that works in that space, but um, they were incentivized to sort of focus resources on dealing with that issue um, over time. And in, in the future, uh, that sort of builds resilience. So the products they're gonna build are gonna be of a safer nature. So in the US, state data breach laws are another example of existing cyber legislation. There's now uh, one for every state. So it used to be like a couple years ago, uh, there's only 47, but the other three have, have gotten um, their own legislation out as well. There was, a, there was an argument there for federal preemption of differing laws across the states. Uh, I won't talk further about that, but if you have questions about it, um, you can go into that. Um, those sorts of things target um, more specific information, usually health and financial information, which has a lot of regulatory structure built up around it already. Uh, beyond that, currently there's no broad federal legislation governing the Internet of Things. That being said, there is a lot of push right now to do have some sort of a comprehensive privacy um, framework of legislation. So the Trump administration two weeks ago uh, released a request for the Department of Commerce to create something parallel to the NIST cybersecurity framework that would be about privacy. Um, and that is an example of, of sort of where this is leading. California most recently uh, passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, which is the toughest piece of privacy legislation that the US has seen so far. Uh, that, is, that is also, California is pretty good at being like the first one out of the gate with like some sort of, uh, of regulation. So I think that sort of symbolizes what the regulatory conversation is gonna be about soon. Another couple of um, weeks ago, uh, actually it was last week, Apple, and a whole bunch of other companies, like telecom companies, 
um, came out in favor of cybersecurity privacy legislation. Um, so this is this is kind of the current conversation right now. Now, economists love to use the phrase that every decision involves trade-offs. So what are some of the trade-offs with the regulatory structure? Um, there's a trade-off first between data privacy and convenience. Um, there's a trade-off between security and convenience. Uh, so anyone who implement, implemented like two-factor authentication on your accounts, you can sort of realize that it takes a little bit more time, but you're a little bit or a lot more secure. Um, and overall, there's a trade-off between safety regulations and innovation. So my colleague, Adam Fear at Mercatus, he wrote a book called Permissionless Innovation. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a pretty cool framework on how to think about emerging tech. Um, so he calls this the tension between precautionary regulation and permissionless innovation. Uh, permissionless innovation itself is the idea that companies and individuals shouldn't have to ask for permission in order to experiment. There are ob obviously uh, constraints and, and caveats that go into each specific case-by-case -case example of what sort of emerging technology we're talking about. Um, but that's kind of the framework that my approach falls under. So the GDPR is an example of uh, precautionary regulation, the general data protection regulation passed in the EU, went into effect this year. Um, one survey suggested that 52% of US companies possess data on EU citizens, so we're liable for making these changes. Um, this can include, um, specifically some of the requirements for the GDPR are things like uh, you have to notify within 72 hours if there's a data breach to your consumers. So Facebook did that notably last week. Um, there's also a lot of requirements on how you keep your data and what you make available to users. Um, so for example, if you go on, on your Spotify account, uh, you'll see that you can download what they've downloaded about you. So you have that ability as well. There's, there's things like the right to be forgotten that's associated with that um, as well. Uh, to me, that's an example of a precautionary regulation. Um, the EU has a very different approach to seeing, viewing privacy as a, as a universal right than the US does. Um, and so a lot of that has been built from uh, that assumption. So in summary, uh, cyber insecurity is a, it's a very complex problem. There's no silver bullet solution. And instead, I'm going to advocate a different approach and that's one based on permissionless innovation and resilience as an end goal. So um, what is cyber resilience? So I argue that the proper role for government is to foster resilience in a bottom-up fashion by supporting the IoT ecosystem's own ability to adapt and learn. Now, one metaphor that I want to steal from Russ Roberts, who's, from, uh, who's at Stanford's Hoover Institute, involves forest fires. So he, argue, he argued that in the beginning of fighting forest fires, um, the firemen and, and pretty much everyone was operating under the assumption that fires are just always bad. They're, they're, never, they're never a good thing. Um, so they made a practice of putting out every fire that existed. As a result of that, the brush built up, and so now um, a fire is catastrophic. So in the same way, operating on the assumption that we should eliminate all IoT vulnerabilities will compromise the ability of the ecosystem to self-correct. So the risk of cyber attacks and forest fires should be managed, not prevented. Um, like nature, uh, IoT is a, comp uh, is a very complex system. It's why I've been using the word ecosystem a lot. There's sort of an organic element to it. Um, threats evolve, but so do the or so do solutions that address those threats. So another example I'll give is from financial economist Arnold Kling. He talks about how we don't want a financial system that never has a crisis. Instead, we want a financial system that is robust or resilient to crisis. So this is sort of, uh, it demonstrates exactly where I'm going with this. Um, another way of looking at it is that we should attempt, we should not attempt to, uh, to, to approach complex, unpredictable systems like they are simple systems. Instead, we need to focus on risk management. The resilience approach moves beyond short-term response for specific incidents to longer-term engagement with multiple players. It recognizes that the only sustainable way to confront large-scale disturbances is to empower stakeholders at multiple levels to remain persistent in the face of threats. So I argue that we can achieve <coughs> resilience through polycentric governance. The theory of polycentric governance comes from Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. Eleanor is the only woman to have won the Nobel Prize in Economics. She won it in 2009, shared it with Oliver Williamson. Um, if you look in her books, you'll find a whole ton of flowcharts that look like this one. Uh, these are basically just webs of, of interconnected associations and relationships that sort of provide uh, governance. And I'll give a quick definition of governance because we've talked a lot about it. Um, 
Governance is the structures and processes that manage, uh, be, uh, manage behavior, um, and they also provide constraints on that behavior. So uh, basically her, the, the idea that is represented by this, this graph here is that we live in this dynamic world with a lot of different actors that are playing a role in how the rules evolve over time and, and, uh, and how we behave in the cyberspace. So she studied common pool research management. Uh, the consensus in public administration at the time was that for public goods, so parks, defense, watersheds, the tragedy of the commons will necessarily occur and everyone will, for example, siphon off the water and then it will be depleted. Um, and then the idea was, well, that is a market failure. So what we need is for government to come in um, and award water rights. And her big insight was actually to observe that in the real world, individuals muddle through with solutions in the absence of government. So people were using norms and shaming uh, to enforce water rights. Um, and entrep entrepreneurs were looking at, at these opportunities, or at these failures as opportunities. So um, a polycentric system of governance should include a lot of institutional arrange arrangements at multiple levels, and those arrangements are going to compete and cooperate in overlapping jurisdictions. Polycentric itself means multiple uh, centers of decision making. So a polycentric system of governance is a process of institutional development. Institutions, I've said that word a lot, they're mechanisms of social order. So courts, governments, it also includes a, the domain of voluntary association and civil society. So that includes things like the center we're at now and the one that I work for. Um, it is also a rulemaking process. So it's importantly, it includes users who help to set the norms of behavior in, in cyberspace. Um, polycentricity is also characterized by organizational learning and experimentation as well as a focus on outcomes, uh, flexibility in regards to outcomes, rather than hierarchical um, uh, a rigid approach to that. So this is very important for dealing with like dynamic complex problems of which cyber, cyber insecurity is one. So another important insight of Ostrom's work is recognizing that the state's itself administrative apparatus is part of a more complex social governance system. So there are many different uh, governance alternatives at different levels that perform different roles. But this heterogeneity and this redundancy uh, mean that government is just one form of governance. Um, governance can be provided by many other decision-making spheres. Uh, so in this way, it's an entirely new viewpoint. Uh, government is just one actor in an ecosystem, and companies, trade associations, civil society, and researchers including users, can all play a role. So let's look at what that means for the cybersecurity space. Um, this pie chart is very symbolic. It represents uh, a lot of the different, what I'm gonna, these things on the side here are little solutions um, that, that solve 3% like of the problem, that get us to a place, say, of 80%, that's like a sustainable level uh, of cybersecurity. So I've just established that distributed threats require distributed solutions. Um, so what does that look like? The resilience approach, it includes a role for ISPs in, approach, in, in addressing problems with botnets um, and providing business-to-business -business services. Companies like Arbo, Cloudflare, and IBM do that. Um, it includes a role for third parties in providing certification programs. So the Online Trust Alliance released a framework that is that sort of designed a certification program. Uh, it hasn't taken off yet. Um, the third, there's also an effort in government to do the same thing. The Energy Star um, program I mentioned is, is sort of pioneered by Senator Markey. Um, so that's a conversation currently being had. Um, third party accreditation organizations and standards associations can provide information to uh, consumers about, uh, well, not only information to consumers, but also um, design requirements and sort of like frameworks for companies to, to uh, agree on sort of base level cybersecurity. Um, there's also a role for cyber insurance. This is usually where I lose everyone in the talk because it's cyber insurance. Uh, but uh, basically, I think cyber insurance is absolutely the coolest thing ever because it aligns incentives between the private sector um, and with a monetary incentive. So like, if you are going through the process of getting cyber insurance, you have to check uh, boxes off. You have to look at your own cybersecurity practices. And then the premium is tied to better cybersecurity behavior. Um, now, I also want to note that like, uh, a role for sort of more technical standards. So we all have on the back of our phones uh, the uh, underwriter's lab symbol that shows that it's not going to, the cord's not going to explode in our face, the phone has been tested to, to not have a sort of like physical harm against us. Um, a 
And then another piece that's often left on the wayside is guarantees and warranties, which companies can, can use more and more. Uh, what that provides is a way to signal to consumers that they're doing something about cybersecurity. So something with a longer warranty you might buy because it's, it's going to be more secure over time. Uh, one last little piece uh, is, is empowering users. So there's actually exist products out there that you can buy and attach to your home router that will monitor the traffic in your, in your, uh, in your home and tell you which devices may be part of the botnet or which, um, which um, different devices might have malware on them based on their analyzing uh, homes across the United States. Um, so that exists as an option as well and empowers users at the ground, on the ground to do something about cybersecurity. Now there's also a, a big role for government. So government can ex encourage experimentation without preemptive regulation, so it can adopt the technology itself. Uh, it can convene stakeholders to help make frameworks, which is doing well right now. I, I, I'm very in favor of the Department of Commerce, NTIA, and NIST's efforts um, in this regard. Um, it can also promote uh, the solutions that I mentioned above, these market -based, more market-based solutions. So another thing I want to point out is there's already a policy mechanisms in place to deal with, uh, with harms related to cybersecurity and privacy. And this is evolving. It's an imperfect mechanism. But the FTC has the power to uh, go after companies and to investigate uh, when there are fraud and deceptive acts. So if a company has said, I, uh, I promise this level of security, and then they don't deliver, um, the FTC can come after them with, with fines and, and investigation. And currently, Equifax is, is undergoing that process. Um, there is evidence now that the resilience approach is being adopted at some level. So uh, NTIA, I mentioned, they publish a green paper that uses the language of resilience um, in this space. And then the resilience approach, what it does is accounts for the complexity and dynamism of the cyber threat landscape. So rather than finding a single policy solution, uh, the resilience approach suggests that there's many, many 3 to 10% solutions that get us to a manageable level. Now, in reality, some level of insecurity will always remain. Um, and rather than threat eradication, we should just attempt to uh, focus on the language of mitigation in that space. Now, I want to visit one more uh, case study before I finish up. Uh, this was pretty interesting. So I don't know if any of you followed this, but Maersk is an international shipping company. Um, and it had its databases completely wiped as a result of collateral war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and Ukraine. So basically what happened was Russia um, put a piece of malware that was attached to Ukrainian tax software. Now, a lot of international companies used that tax software because they had to pay taxes in Ukraine. Um, and it actually ended up wiping, just completely wiping uh, computers and databases. So it was great. There's a great Wired article on this. Basically, they interviewed the IT guy and he was like, Basically, I sat there and everyone's computer went black. Like, if you can imagine being an IT guy, everyone's computer just goes black. Um, and so for weeks, um, there was disruptions. Uh, ships lined up at ports, trucks lined up at ports. Like, they didn't know what to do or where to go because there was no logistics database on what to do. Um, so what did they do in response? They actually flew in all of their regional directors and were like, do whatever you need to do to get your region back online. They ended up buying a whole bunch of computers in, in their London-based office and like just going crazy. But what ended up happening, this shows, this demonstrates entrepreneurship, is um, one of the service centers in Ghana had blacked out during this whole attack. And so it wasn't affected by the attack. So they had one copy of their database, like in Ghana. Now, nobody in Ghana had passports to fly to London or visas. So they flew somebody to Nigeria and somebody from Ghana and then brought it, uh, handed over the database and brought it back to London. Um, so these are sort of the if there isn't a lesson, that is one. Like this company is never gonna f do that again. They're gonna have hard, uh, like hardwired backups and, and different ways of dealing with this scenario. Um, but I want to point out a few things that this sort of demonstrates. The first is um, they were entrepreneurial about solutions. So they actually called in, in Deloitte, who, who helped them figure out that this was the thing they were gonna do with their regional managers, um, and they also um, empowered entrepreneurs on the ground. Uh, they were figuring out one step at a time uh, how to get that <coughs> database all the way back to London. Uh, and then they changed their review processes to prioritize cybersecurity spending after the fact. So now a lot of their, their stuff's going through uh, anything they request, the, the managers are, are signing off on it at a faster rate. Um, and so to me, what this demonstrates is that it's pretty important to have organizational learning. Um, it's easy to offset that if they were checking sort of compliance uh, boxes in, some, in regards to some sort of uh, 
international or framework or, or regulation. Um, but basically, empowering entrepreneurs on the ground, introducing redundancy in the form of backups, and instituting processes for learning from cyber attacks are critical features of building resilience. And promoting polycentric governance, in my mind, will encourage companies to be flexible in responding and learning from attacks. So, in conclusion, here's what I want you to take away from this presentation. An appreciation of the complexity of the cybersecurity problem and the importance of having multiple stakeholders pursue a variety of solutions. The other piece is viewing the, ins the issue of cyber insecurity as one that occurs in an ecosystem in which government is only one source of possible governance. So now I will take any questions that you have. Thank you for listening. Um, and yeah, I'd love to have a conversation as well if you have anything to add. Thank you, Anna. Um, we have some time to have a conversation in about a half hour if you want. Uh, anyone, any questions? Sure. So, talking about governance around in government, and you talked about some of these, you talked about what Europe's doing, what the US, and there's much more different context in that. I'm wondering about the stakes in international governance when the governments have competing interests, but the non state actors like the companies and think tanks will not have much more cooling preferences. So, how do you feel that governance may be? troubled or more complicated when you have the different actors state to state versus not state and the role of cybersecurity and IT. Yeah, um, so one of my favorite conversations that so deals mainly with non-state act uh, actors is about active defense. So like, do we allow US companies to, to fight back against um, state or non-state actors um, abroad? Uh, a lot of the complications with that is the potential for collateral damage. Um, now I know everybody's going to talk about one aspect of this, and I'd be interested to hear uh, what your your opinions on the matter are. Um, there is no doubt that this is going to be. I'm going to go back to this one. There's no doubt that this is going to be an issue of overlapping jurisdiction, at which some levels of organization are better at doing doing certain things than others. So um, another piece I didn't delve into highly is the difference between steering and rowing functions. So. Traditional local, state, and federal government is better at, at dealing with um, rowing functions than with steering. So rowing is like um, some sort of hierarchical, you know, we just follow out uh, a set of course of action. So like things like tax compliance is, is a, is a um, rowing function. And a steering function is something that's sort of setting the end goals, the outcomes, and the, and the rules of the game. Um, and that needs to be a more deliberative process with a lot of different actors. And so the question becomes, like, at what level do you want to assign decision rights over a certain problem? Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know the, the answer to that. But if you have a suggestion, hit me up. Mm -hmm. hey, um, I loved the um, Eleanor Ostrom shout out. I'm a real fanboy. Um, I'm wondering if you could dig back into that, specifically like the comparison with, with monocentric bureaucratic administration. I'm not. Um, this may be just a domain failing of mine, but I'm not really seeing <laughs> where the proposal for a monocentric bureaucratic administration is in the landscape. It doesn't seem like anyone's proposing a nationalizing IoT. Like even GDPR is, puts most of the governance onto Apple or Facebook or whatever, or consumers to fight it themselves. Like it seems like there's a fair amount of spreading the labor around. So what is the, you know, the Ostrom model that you're endorsing to. Sure. Um, I should have said more monocentric bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic administration. So the idea here is a, it's a spectrum. Um, and I mentioned bureaucracy is good at something, at solving some sort of problems. Um, and more distributed uh, governance solutions are good at solving others, more complex and dynamic problems. Um, and so in general, this is just highlighting a two different tendencies. It, it's highlighting the fact that right now, uh, what it seems like we're headed towards is handing more responsibilities over to government, which has that sort of hierarchical and rigid constraint. Um, whereas we operate on a, a, a landscape that's changing over time. And so it's changing very quickly over time. So having those sort of fixed regulatory structures that are being carried out by bureaucratic actors is in some ways um, an impediment to dealing with the problem in a more complex and a, and a comprehensive way. 
so this, this framework considers government as, as purely a, a bureaucracy of employees rather than any kind of like democratic field house where people might vote on something. Uh, so I'll tell you that my sort of vision of the bureaucratic administrative state comes from both Gordon Tulloch and uh, Ludwig von Mises. Sure. Both, of them, both of them wrote books titled Bureaucracy. Um, now, the interesting piece of that is when Mises defines bureaucracy, he's talking purely about what you just said. Um, government as, as a hierarchical structure where somebody up above makes a rule and the people carry it out. We know it's a lot more complex than that, so I've done an oversimplification of it. Um, but in general, uh, the, the origin of this research actually came from my boss, Stephanie Hackley. She does disaster uh, relief and uh, response research. And basically, what she looked at was like the way FEMA approached uh, doing one simple task. So for example, um, distributing food after a disaster versus how like Home Depot and, and other people in that space or other companies in that space were able to solve that problem in a, in a much better fashion. Um, and the idea, I think, behind that is that you, you just have different capabilities. And one of those pieces is, is local knowledge. So um, what did they do when they invited all the uh, speakers or all the regional directors? What did Maersk do when they brought them all in? They were using the local knowledge of those people to like solve the solutions in those in those contexts. Now, um, it's hard when you're when you're sitting in an agency very far away from say a uh, natural disaster to to have that sort of knowledge of how best to solve the solution on the ground. Um, so that's an example of sort of like the contrast between a bureaucratic response to a very complex natural disaster versus um, private company or even community level response. Um, which is very good examples of. Does that, does that address your? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, are you familiar with the garbage can theory decision I have? It's uh, Marsh and Olson, Cole Marsh and Olson, something like that. It's this idea that organizations just generate tons of knowledge and information, and it's not necessarily fit for any particular problem, or maybe it fit a problem they had, but it didn't work out, so they put it to the side. And then later, another problem comes up here. And we say, oh, wait a minute. We have a bucket of solutions, a garbage can of yeah. solutions of things that didn't fit for other stuff, but we can apply it to this new problem. And I see something of that nature when you're talking about um, the design of the plugs, the well, like certifications, and these sorts of old, not old, but different systems that were for different sorts of problems that may be given new life with these new sorts of issues with cybersecurity resilience and other things that we're looking at. And so I'm wondering, maybe this will just be some of your notes to go see how garbage can might uh, fit into this framework, which will then lead into the question I was going to have. Uh, when you're looking at these larger horizontal government structures, uh, you gave the example of the company that doing these entrepreneurial things and pulling local knowledge, but that works within a company where it has its communication structures, it has its organizational um, knowledge flows, when you get into a horizontal governance structure, there might be challenges extracting knowledge from partnering actors and institutions yeah. because local government might not know what the NGO knows in order to ask and get that knowledge out. Or the company might not know what data the local governments have to pull that out. Okay. So where do these knowledge bottlenecks, communication bottlenecks occur in a sort of polycentric governance structure when it comes to resilience? Yeah, there's a lot of beautiful work in the public choice sphere on that. So I point you to Gordon Tulloch, who he like does. A, he has an entire um, section in, in one of his books on like things like whispering down the lanes, which are communication problems between levels of management. Mm -hmm. So like it's basically a game of telephone in that context. Um, he also he also uh, talks about other examples of of ways that information could be misinterpreted. The classic examples here are like. Um, some of the problems with like moral hazard and the principal agent issue. So like if you have somebody and they have a vision and their employee is like, no, I want to do this instead, or I want to shirk, um, then how that creates like challenges for carrying out uh, outcomes. But um, I want to go back to sort of the disaster resilience piece I was talking about. Um, there's a cool example from there, uh, an example of local government that when empowered um, could have done some pretty amazing work. and, and had to go around the back end in order to do it. So there was a woman named Doris Mortier who uh, was a school superintendent in, after Hurricane Katrina in the um, Lower Ninth Ward. And she basically decided, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
bring everyone back. I'm going to be the one to restart this the school system. Um, so she ordered trailers. Um, she she couldn't get, uh, she had to go through the bureaucratic structure, so she wasn't able to actually get a license to order those trailers, so she just kind of did it and then charged the government. Uh, they didn't like that, so they uh, they went after her for a time. But she actually ended up um, sort of being the feature that that like resulted in our community coming back. And so into another piece of literature, um, it's called Community Revival in the Wake of Disaster. It's written by Stephanie, my boss, and then uh, her boss, Virgil Storer. And they focus entirely upon how like lower level entrepreneurs, even in government, um, and also definitely on the ground. So like there was a head of a, a Vietnamese community and a, and a church there that also played like a huge role in why these communities were bounded from disaster. Um, how like empowering those different levels um, on the ground can allow like those distributed solutions to come about. Thank you for your question and your suggestion of the garbage can. Yeah. So I'll jump back in here. Um, so a lot of what you're talking about has definite grounds for government, commercial sector, things like this. But a thriving area of IoT are hobbyist DIYers and people who are in the maker spaces. Yeah. So how do you see them interacting if they don't even see themselves as part of the governance structure or how they can access into it? So if they're going to be bound by decisions these governance structures can make and not necessarily realize it or try to resist the trend and you know, do a go at it approach and how that keeps um, cybersecurity issues open. Yeah, so they play a huge role in setting, setting, setting the norms. So like, do they use open source software? Do they um, spend time catching other people's vulnerabilities? Is that like a normal, normal thing? Um, they can also, uh, so one of the coolest pieces of policy that I think we would benefit from changing um, in this space is, is allowing cybersecurity researchers for more license to go in and, and to deal with um, devices, take them apart, figure out their vulnerabilities, and have a sort of an exemption for that from some of the intellectual property legislation that already exists. Um, so another thing they can do is, is fight that battle. There's a lot of like really, really cool organizations that are, that are sort of pushing for more rights for sort of the lower level community of people that deal with these devices, um, and even make these devices, to sort of be more empowered. Um, so I'm thinking of like, ACLU has done some of this work, and Open Society, and a few other, like EFF, they're, they're a big one in the space. Um, so <coughs> even people at that level can sort of like, voluntarily associate at a higher level to like create policy change. Um, so that's one way that I, I see that happening as well. Thanks for all your questions. So uh, you brought up the point that we had the privacy framework being called last week or a week ago. Yeah. And we had these actors who were supposed to be community advocates, but when they're excluded from that, how does that change the dynamics of this governance structure? Are they able to yeah. create a circumvention that actually works? Yeah, so, um, so two things. First of all, the, the privacy framework, you can actually participate in that process. It is open to the public. Right, but what was invited to the initial offering of that? Was oh. Excluding of the Yeah, at some level you have to, yeah. Uh, so this also gets back to his first question. Um, basically, the other thing that you have is like, when you do sort of multi-stakeholder governance, so let's take internet governance sphere, then like UN conferences um, in this space, or like meetups of the ITU are these incredibly complex and like really time-staking um, sort of experiences. Because the idea there is like, well, if we can get to some sort of consensus, then maybe we can take some action. Um, but you can see sort of par paralysis occurring because there's too many actors that have decision rights, right? Um, so there's some sort of a balance there between like, at what level do we have this conversation? And at the end of the day, like, is consensus the way that we're going to get to like a new uh, sort of policy framework? Or is it gonna be some you know, ad hoc sort of development um, from the ground up. I think you're gonna have both. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have a privacy framework at the federal level that's pioneered by, by NIST and NTIA it, with industry stakeholders. Um, I'm Just hoping that- Just industry and government? No, Cause no. Because they did not include like EFF or any consumer advocate group in that framework development. That's what the article, at least the oh, EFF really? published. 
last really? week. Yeah, that was brought out. So. Oh, I think that well, so they now have open comments and stuff. Yeah, so saying it's a comment the system the public yeah. can engage in, but the yeah. initial framework that's actually handed out ignored that a voice mm -hmm. in that. Uh, framework. Yeah, I don't. I, I, just, I personally think they should be part of the I, conversation. Just saying, this yeah. is, so this is a dynamic that could happen at, at various government, not government, governance, just mm -hmm. to clarify this. Yeah. Uh, is this robust and which allows for these type of institutional decisions to be corrected based on the way the interactions are between the different groups? Or do we see the capability of power dynamics to be shifted in certain favors based on yeah. how the government chooses to make things. Another way to state your question is like, does the comment period like actually result in change in the, in the rulemaking process? Which would be an interesting study to do. Um, I don't know, I, I would be in favor of them being part of the process from the beginning. I also think that um, they have the opportunity to develop, to develop a, and have developed to some degree, a guidance and frameworks on the outside. Mm -hmm. Um, trade associations also have done a pretty good job of, of doing this as well. Um, so yeah, to me it's like definitely, it's going to have to be some sort of a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, I would be curious about what people in this room think about the difference. Is there a difference between privacy and cybersecurity? Are those two pieces of the same side of the coin um, or not? Uh, and should we have two different regulatory approaches addressing those problems? Also, if any of you have thought about the problem of what is cyber harm versus privacy harm? Um, that is an ongoing debate, and one in which I have not uh, written very much about, but I'm curious to see what people think. So if we draw the line from a technical uh, box, mm -hmm. then, and there are different ways people look at it from technical privacy to a socially defined privacy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the IoT discussion right now is on technical framing of uh, the security and basically risk mitigation um, practices. And those have resulting effects on access to data and various other escalation of privileges, which are degrees of security. Um, but that's kind of where, when I look at this, uh, a lot of the discussion, that I'm, at least that I've been listening to, is mostly on the technical ramifications, uh, which have implied uh, privacy and data access issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, I see cybersecurity and privacy as overlapping spheres, mm -hmm. that um, there are going to be some privacy issues that aren't security issues. So like Facebook has your data, and they're using, um, came out this week, like if you provide them with a phone number for two-factor authentication, for instance, they'll use that to cross-reference you and target ads to you, mm -hmm. even though they don't tell you they're doing that, which is really interesting. Um, so that's kind of a privacy concern, but not a security concern, versus you can have security concerns that are, you know, somebody gets into your network and gets intellectual property, which isn't a privacy issue, right? That's, a, that's an IP issue. Um, or somebody can get into your network and blow a button, right? So they can use your computing equipment to do something to the rest of the world, right? And so they may not steal your personal information while they do that. They may just use your coffee maker to attack Ukraine. Um, um, so there's sort of, and then there are the, the overlaps where it's like somebody steals personal information from a, a company due to a cybersecurity vulnerability or from an individual due to a cybersecurity vulnerability, like somebody gets into your baby monitor and they can see your kid. You know, there's all sorts of, um, of places where they intersect, but they're, so you can treat them in a unitary fashion, but there are like things that aren't that aren't in that overlapping section, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and we've been going back and forth because we just were working on teaching uh, the undergrads about cybersecurity and privacy, and so it was like, well, should we just be teaching cybersecurity? Should we just be teaching privacy? Should we teach them both? Should we teach them both as a single thing? And and there's there's places where it's not the same. So it's, it's an ongoing debate, I guess. Yeah, thanks, that was really helpful. I mean, especially in the sphere of like regulation and legislation, these, often, these conversations often start with the definition, like what are we regulating? And so many of the conversations are, are so broad. That I spend the whole time like talking about like what are we regulating, you never actually get to the point where you're like, well, this is a thing that actually causes harm. That's what we should be talking about, rather than, you know, 
okay, great, you know, I know this person's phone number, but that's not causing harm right now versus, like, there's, so there are vulnerabilities that exist that aren't currently causing harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Versus, you know, things that are, maybe not, you don't even look like vulnerabilities that are causing harm. Sure thing. Yeah, I think you kind of getting to the same point. There's, I think there's also a different user, or there's a different expectation of how users, people who use these systems, um, should be approaching the, the dual issues of privacy and cybersecurity, right? Privacy is something that you need to be, the user should be conscious of and should take advantage of, for example, on Facebook or Twitter, privacy settings that, that can be adjusted depending on your own personal evaluation of how much you value your privacy. Um, whereas, and, then, and that's, this is not, these aren't exactly clear cut categories, but then the cybersecurity thing is like, that's a, there's an external threat that a device you use could have a cybersecurity vulnerability in it. Like, you know, like you could buy your kid a web-enabled teddy bear and not have made a mistake on the micro level of like setting the, with the privacy settings, but have made a mistake at a macro level by buying an insecure device that you didn't really understand yeah. um, the implications of. So that's kind of, right, I think people blame users for privacy breaches sometimes. Uh, like you should have known that this was gonna go on the internet for everyone to see. Yeah. But people don't blame individual users as much for botnet attacks because it's not seen quite as much as the user's problem. Well, sometimes they do. But sometimes they do, yeah. right? I, that's what I'm saying. It's not entirely clear cut, but um, I don't know, I just don't know where that leaves us as, uh, as far as policy interventions are. I mean, I would say that there are like, some people somewhere in some place in time blame people for these particular things. These are all like emic definitions that emerge like in particular institutional yes. framework. Like the notable thing about GDPR is, is framing privacy as an organizational threat on an individual rather than an individual's vulnerability to the threats outside of them. Like there, I, I think like it's easy to imagine a world in which there are different you know, conceptions of the both of them. Like I, I think the, the power of something like the contextual integrity approach, and maybe what's like dumped it down over the couple of years, is that you can imagine, um, you know, a violation of my information being brought outside of you know X institutional context as you know a violation of my personal privacy, but the incident in and of itself could be a cybersecurity or physical security harm just because of the nature of that institutional context. Like I, I think it's. The Things are seem to be like they're not ideal types. They're so like they're they seem to be like emerged in like pretty specific local economies. That's a good point. Yeah. So something that this led me to think of is um, I watched the Consumer Product Safety Commission's hearing on IoT devices in full, uh, and it was very interesting because they really were dealing with like what are we trying to regulate? Well, the question that they asked at the, at the outset was like, do IoT devices cause like physical harm? Uh, to individuals, so like burning and like catching on fire and um, and those types of things. Um, nobody on either of the panels came up with an, an example of that physical harm, but everyone talked about how possible it was, and most people concurred that the CPSC should develop some some type of, of regulatory framework. So this is sort of gets back to your monocentric versus polycentric. They have a they have a specific area in which they have. Um, have jurisdiction. And so in that area, they sort of have monocentric decision-making power um, over exactly like how, you know, physical harm caused to con consumers and, and what that might mean for IoT devices. So that's a, it's, that conversation is still evolving. Um, they, I submitted comments, I know a ton of people did. I have, uh, no one has really done a good job of answering what is sort of an informational harm versus a physical harm and how does that overlap if a device has the capability to do both. Um, so what does that regulatory framework look like uh, specifically? And I think it, says, it, it sort of demonstrates um, where we see the conversation going. And, and I, I would push back even on, on saying like that is like a fairly modest example because that tunnel vision that CBSC has is like is a product of like other institutions pushing on back on them over time to narrow their tunnel vision. Like it's, it's really notable that they're not mostly, to my knowledge, like talking about autonomous vehicles for the most yeah, part. Like that's yeah. the transportation board, yeah. which has plenty to say about Tesla and like you know, not recognizing that van and killing that guy in California two years totally. ago. Like so I think like the, and that's a product of, you know, decades of life lobbying from like the car industry to be considered as like a separate part of thing away from like air conditioners and crap like that. 
it's like, sure. like these are all like very much interrelated. That's a very good point. Yeah, they also don't have like FAA jurisdiction. Yeah, exactly. Services. Yeah, so you're not going to worry about drones, like which could be considered IOTs, but all of them. Yeah. Uh, is anybody else any questions? Well, I was saying since we're installed time loaded about security and privacy, you guys made some good distinctions, but I was going to say. There's an area in which those overlaps do occur, but they're at different levels for individuals and institutions. Yeah. 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 So the, the data breach is the big example you could have for a company where they may have bond, they may have requirements to report to government about the data breach, but then it may not be necessarily be disclosed to the public mm -hmm. because of concerns of how it may affect the stocks and mm -hmm. you know, everything else. So that privacy conversation changes depending on which audience. And that also prevents consumer choice to uh, make an informed decision on what product they're actually supporting. Yeah. yeah. So there's secondary effects as well. Awesome. Thank you for those comments. Mm -hmm. Well, and then there's the third party harm, right? So, you know, you're not a customer of Equifax or mm -hmm. Experian mm -hmm. or TransUnion, you're a, a product of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your information is their product, not you have given it to them, they just have it. So there's sort of that additional piece of, you know, this is a privacy loss that I had no control over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that when the university lost everybody's social security number, like that was, you know, yeah, the University of Maryland lost the entire ID database in like 2014, yeah. 2012, something like that. Nice. Um, so it was like everybody's social security number and name and not a lot of other information because it would literally be the database that used to print the old IDs that had your social security number on the front. Why was that ever? That was the that was institutional ID forever. number. That was your student ID number. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That oh. was the student ID number when I was in college. It was the student ID number when I started at Maryland. That was just how it was. That's why our UIDs are nine digits, because yeah. they were social security numbers. Um, but so, so, yeah, there are places where you can lose privacy without ever having given somebody information, I guess, is the, the other leaps that, that we kind of run into this weird. Very much like an environmental governance model, like if yeah. my Facebook data or my Equifax data are leaked, it's not just about me, it's about all my friends who are yeah. also connected to me in the network. Yeah, well that was part of their argument. It was really interesting, they were like using people's um, address books to suggest like friends to other people. And so like the phone number you never gave Facebook is being used to um, identify you across other people's networks so that you can say like, oh, like this guy has this phone number for this person this person also has this phone number, this person maybe they know each other, that sort of thing. But it's not, even though the phone number is your phone number, it's not your data under GDPR because you didn't provide it, so it's like, it's somebody else's data, which is a really interesting distinction. So they won't show it to you, and they won't tell you they have it because it's someone else's data, even though it's about you. Can I ask a question? Sure. What was the institutional sort of process of learning after um, that sort of breach happened? Um, well, I mean, that, that just came out this past week. So. Okay. Oh, do you mean the Maryland. university? The university Maryland, yeah. yeah. Um, they said don't do it again, and now they have two-factor authentication. I think it was like a database on somebody's laptop that yeah. somebody left somewhere. So okay. don't don't put it on your laptop. Everybody, yeah. everybody quit doing that. So that's the general. University thing. IT is perhaps too polycentric. <laughs> they're, they're huge, and they, yeah. you know, they. Many, many but May I ask, just as a conclusion, um, yeah. Yeah. Your, can you give us like a brief preview of command attraction of like your own empirical work like in this space? Like what are you doing to kind of build off on this stuff? What can you look forward to? Thank, thank, you, for, thank you for asking. Um, so the thing I'm actually most excited is applying polycentric governance to uh, social virtual reality okay. applications. So like VR chat. If you take that space, you have not only the governing laws that exist, over like what content needs to occur or not occur. Um, you also have community standards that like VRChat will set for their users, and you also have the users creating norms. So a great example there was somebody had a seizure in a virtual reality um, in, in VRChat, basically, and, and people around him, some of whom were making fun of him, uh, stopped the making, the, the, uh, the making fun of from happening. So they defended him and were like, we need to make sure this guy is okay. And so how does that evolve over time in a, in a space where the norm was pretty much harassment of each other and other players. Um, and so I'm super interested in, in looking at that space. Uh, this needs to turn into a paper, um, which I intend to have done by next spring and be presenting at various stages during that time. And then I'm doing a, a lot of disaster resilience 
from the same sort of um, perspective. And I'm going to follow up with you because I have a really good uh, sort of framework of what uh, what it looks like to have sort of bureaucratic administration versus um, polycentric administration built out in a specific context of disaster policy. Um, but the whole like overarching uh, theme is is sort of that ecological approach uh, to to big complex collective action problems like cybersecurity or post disaster um, spaces. And mostly, uh, I mean, it's really yeah. historical qualitative policy analysis. Thank you. Okay. And with that, let's all say thank you one last yes, time very much. Thank you. And next week, uh, Dan will be leading our reading group for the CAD on the uh, boundary objects, what are and what are not boundary objects.